So for those who are just joining, thank you for being here. My name is Ryan Lavis. This short session is sponsored by Financial Behavior Keynote Group. And as I was saying just a minute ago, I teach full-time at Utah Valley University. I'm also a keynote speaker. I'm an author. I'm a consultant. I'm a husband and a father as well. My specialty is client communication and specifically what can financial advisors do to better connect with their clients? So how can they improve their communication skills to better connect with their clients? Mastering the art of inquiry is what we're going to be talking about today and, and specifically the seven principles for asking powerful questions. This is a quote from Misty Copeland, who is a famous baller ballerina. She says, I think the key to success is not being afraid to ask questions. Misty Copeland went through a lot of hard times as she was growing up and really found her calling when she when she found dance. But uh, she said that, that this is really the key for her was being willing to ask the hard questions of people. So that's what we're going to be looking at today is, is how can we ask the right kinds of questions? What are some of the keys that we can utilize to ask better questions with our clients? So why ask questions? Well, there's a number of benefits that have been found from asking questions, including that it creates a connection with your client. It engages the other person instead of them just listening to you. It actually engages them as part of the conversation, which as financial advisors, that's what we're trying to do, right, is engage the other person. It builds our knowledge. It, it, we can't learn about a person or about their financial situation without asking good questions. It builds rapport with the client. It builds trust, which is a huge thing. We all know that building trust is one of the most important things that we do as financial advisors, and then it inspires action as well. And we'll see some examples of all of these as we go through this presentation today. So here are the seven principles for asking powerful questions. So I'm going to go through these principles. We're, we're then going to put up a list of, of good questions that I've collected. And then I would love to hear from all of you as well. So what are some of your favorite questions that you've utilized with your clients in the past? So first, let's start with this quote from W. Ed Edwards Deming, who was a motivational speaker at one point. He says, if you do not know how to ask the right question, you discover nothing. So again, if you do not know how to ask the right question, you discover nothing. So we, we are all about discovering everything we can about our clients, right? About their financial situation, their family situation, everything about them. So we, we need to make sure that we're asking the right questions of our clients. So principle number one is I would encourage you to write down good questions. Whenever you come across a good question, and this could be from a number of different places, my favorite place to gather good questions is from podcasts, and specifically podcasts where they have guests on. I like to listen to ones that are they're well known, they're popular podcasts, and I like to listen to the types of questions being asked. I think it's it's important to gather them from a lot of different information. I also listen to other advisors. I listen to my students and some of the questions that, that they ask. My, my students recently did a training at Utah Valley University for other coaches. And I, I wrote down a number of the questions that they were utilizing in some of their role play scenarios. So you can get good questions from a number of different places. And like I said, I'll share some of those with you today. And then uh, I would encourage you to continue to seek out good questions, though. In fact, going along this line, I had a student recent who graduated maybe a year ago. And one of the things that he would do to prepare for a client meeting is he would just write down 10 different questions that he wanted to ask that client. And he said that's the only agenda that he would prepare was a list of questions. And he said often he would only ask one or two of those because Follow-up questions would would result as a uh, because he would ask good questions and then follow-up questions would come along. So I would encourage you to do that. As you're preparing for client meetings, actually have a list of questions that you've written down in the past. Principle number two: be genuinely curious. Be genuinely curious. So you're not just listening to respond. You're not just listening to their answer so that you can ask another question but you're being genuinely curious about the things that they're sharing with you. So we want to show our empathy. We want to show our understanding, our knowledge and our expertise. All of those things are great. And, and we want to be able to do that, but it's, it's about being curious about the other client. That's what really matters here. So Polly Campbell, who's a psychologist, she said, curiosity helps us learn, remember, grow and engage in the world. 
So I would encourage you when your clients come into and, and they're they're talking about being scared about the stock market or if they're they're talking about this inheritance that they got or whatever, just you can simply ask them more questions or just say the statement, tell me more about that. And in a lot of cases, they'll solve their own problem. You'll find it as you do that. So, but be genuinely curious about finding everything that you can out about your client. Number three, ask one question at a time and keep it short and keep it clear. So again, one question at a time, keep it short and keep it clear. So here's a bad example. Have you had a chance to talk with a lawyer about your will, a trust, and medical directives? Obviously, the, this is four different questions. First, have you talked with a lawyer? Did you talk about a will? Did you talk about a trust? And did you talk about medical directives? So there's four different questions that are being asked here. And it's just too many things at once. So instead, you might say something like this. Last time we met, we talked about meeting with a, a lawyer. Have you had a chance to do that? That is one question. So you've got a statement up front. We talked about meeting with a lawyer. And then have you had a chance to do that? Again, simple, one question. If they haven't had a chance to meet with their lawyer, well, there's probably not a will, a trust, or medical directives in place. So that's really the only question you need to ask first. So again, one question at a time, keep it short and keep it clear. Now, I love this example. This is from a yearbook uh, that somebody had that somebody posted online. So it says, uh, do you text while driving or do you wait until you get to your destination? <laughs> so you've got two totally different questions there and, uh, and nobody can interpret these, these results. Like yes is much bigger and it only shows 19%. No is smaller. It shows 81%. And what question are they asking? Or are they answering here? Are they answering the one, do you text while driving? Or are they answering the question, do you wait till you get, get to your destination? So make sure that your, your questions are clear, unlike this one here. Principle number four, pause when they finish speaking. Again, pause when they finish speaking. What this does is it allows you to, to it allows them to continue talking if they're, if they're not done. They might just be pausing as well to gather their thoughts. When you're asking more deeper questions and not just you know about their, their net worth or not just about their financial situation, but if you're asking the deeper questions that's going to help you to really build trust with your client, you need to make sure you give them that space so that when they're done speaking, uh, so that you can make sure that they are actually done speaking instead of jumping in. Also, take a moment to process. It's okay for you to be silent for a moment, even if they are all the way done speaking. It's, it's okay for you to be quiet and just allow yourself to process what they said. Don't be afraid of silence. The, there's been some research that shows that clients are comfortable with silence of about seven to 10 seconds. But we as financial advisors, we are uncomfortable with silence that lasts more than two or three seconds. So there's a big difference there between two or three seconds and nine or 10 seconds. So make sure that you get comfortable with that silence and don't be afraid of it. Carl Richard says, trust is a function of asking really good questions, then listening carefully to the answers. And I think that listening carefully, part of that is to make sure that you pause when they finish speaking. Principle number five, avoid asking leading questions. So leading questions are questions that start with, don't you think that, or end with the, with the question right, or don't you agree, or, or it may start with, do you agree that? So these are leading questions where you're trying to get the client to agree with you. So don't you think that the stock market is a great place to invest? Or don't you think that, that it's a good idea for you to get a will in place? These are, very, these are leading questions and you want to avoid doing that. You don't, you're not looking for a specific answer here. You're trying to, if you go, going back to the principle of being genuinely curious, that's what you're doing is you're being curious. You're not trying to lead your, your clients in a certain direction when it comes to questions. Principle number six, the order and the structure of the questions matter. Typically, you want to go from less sensitive to more sensitive questions as you talk with them. There's an NPR show called Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, where they, they do trivia questions to, to people about uh, the events of the past week, news that's going on right now. And they always ask their, when people come on, there's, there's one of the hosts that asks two very specific questions. He says, where are you from? Easy question, right? Everyone can say where they're from, Salt Lake, Cleveland, uh, New York, wherever you might be from. And then this host says, tell me something about the area. 
this again is a very non-threatening question. Where are you from? Everybody can answer that, answer that, and then tell me something about the area. So they might talk about their hometown. They might might talk about the farm that they grew up on, or how they would go and visit their their grandpa who lived just down the street, or there was this great park behind their house, or something like that. So it's a great question to get the client talking a little bit. You're not asking anything financial at this point. You're just saying, hey, tell me something about where you're from. Even if you're from the same area, it's okay. Like I teach at Utah Valley University and most of our students are from either the Salt Lake Valley or, or Utah Valley where I live. And it's okay. I learn new things all the time by talking to my clients and utilizing a question like this. So again, where are you from? And tell me something about the area. And then finally, principle number seven, the most powerful question is a follow-up question. I alluded to this earlier when I was talking about my student who would write out a list of 10 questions and he would often ask a follow-up question and, and would abandon his other questions. So the most powerful question that you can have is a follow-up question. Now this requires active listening. If you're not listening carefully to what your client is saying and how they're responding to you, you're not going to be able to ask good follow-up questions because if you're only thinking about your own agenda and your own questions and the things that you've got written down, it's very difficult to listen to them carefully and, and understand exactly what they're saying and, and be able to ask those really powerful follow-up questions. Brene Brown said this, she said, you're often quick with answers, which can be helpful, but not as helpful as having the right questions. I really like this quote because we have the answers for, for in, in most cases, right? If somebody comes in and they wanna talk about their credit report or their budget, or their investments, or what the stock market is doing, or they're getting their estate plan in place, we have the answers. And that's why they're coming to us. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you don't have, there's not a time and a place to share your answers with the, cl with the client, but be cautious about being too quick with your answers. This is something that I'm always working on as a professor, because when students ask me questions in class, Again, I'm I'm the person up front, right? I'm the expert. I'm there to share things with them. And so it's easy for me to be quick with answers, which can be helpful, again, just as she says here, but not as helpful as having the right questions. So if I can turn that around and ask my students questions or or even ask the class, say, hey, what do you think about this? Instead of just answering my own thoughts, I find that it can be a very powerful experience. So with that, let's share some examples of powerful questions. So I've gathered these over, over years now. I've collected good questions. So I'll share, I've got two, I've, I've probably got about 15 questions here. And then I would love to hear from all of you and here, I'll, I'll turn off my screen share at some point. And I would love to hear some of the questions that you share with your clients. This first one I learned from Michael Kitsis and it was on a podcast that he did with Carl Richard. So Michael Kitsis said, this is one of the, his favorite questions. So he says, to the client, and I'll use Michael as the example here. Michael, thank you for coming in. It shows how committed you are to making smart decisions about money. So first of all, you're complimenting them right up front. You're saying like, thank you for coming in and just showing that, that commitment. So he then says, let's start here. What led you to schedule this appointment today? Simple question that's also pretty non-threatening. They've, they've already scheduled this appointment and they've actually made it to the appointment. Those are two big hurdles for people that are coming in to see a financial advisor. So just asking them that simple question, what led you to schedule this appointment today? That starts off a great conversation about whatever prompted that. People only come in to see us because there's some sort of financial stressor in their lives. It may be good, it may be bad. Maybe they just got an inheritance. Maybe they had a child. Maybe they've got a child heading off to college. There could be a million different reasons that somebody is coming in to see us. So we're starting out, when Michael asks that question, he's starting out by finding out what was the original intention of this appointment. And you may already know that because you do an intake form, but it's okay to ask this again and get them to talk more about the reason that they asked that question. Another one that I really like early on in the appointment is what would need to happen today to make this a good use of your time? I think that this is a great question to ask our clients because a lot of times clients say that they don't feel listened to when they go and talk with a financial advisor. So asking them, what's going to make this a good use of your time today? Generally, your clients will tell you. They're going to say, well, it would be really helpful if we could 
go through my budget and try to cut some, some things out because of inflation. Or it would be helpful if we could review our investments and, and make sure they're still in line with, with, uh, with what my goals are. Or they may want to review their goals. Whatever the case is, you're asking them how they want to spend their time today. All right, I love this question. Why is money important to you? I wouldn't ask this on the, you know, at follow-up meetings, but in the very first appointment that I have with clients, I love to ask this question. Why is money important to you? And I, I warn them ahead of time. I say, hey, this might, might not be a normal question that you would hear from a financial advisor, but it's important for me to understand how you feel about money. So tell me, why is money important to you? And then be really quiet after that. Don't, don't try to elaborate on that. Just stop at that point. Why is money important to you? Generally, they're going to come back and say something like, well, security or, or something like that, financial freedom. And then you just continue asking that question. Well, tell me more about financial freedom. Tell me what security means to you. Why is security important to you? So you can continue to dig deeper and deeper until you really find the core of why money is important to them. So excellent question. And there's the follow up there. What is important about freedom to you? What is important about security to you? This is my favorite question and one I use all the time. It's not even a question, right? I love I love uh, questions that are actually statements. So tell me more. Tell me more. That's it. Just, just saying that to a client encourages them to talk more. I love using this in my class because a, a student will, will share something and, and I'll say, that's awesome. Tell me more. And they always will. People love to tell more. If they've got a story to share with you, they love to share that story. So tell me more should be one of your most the, the most common statements that you make with your clients. Uh, this one ties back to the how is money important to you? It's very similar to that one. But in one word, describe your relationship with money. In one word, describe your relationship with money. Again, I love this question because a lot of people will say, I, I asked this question, by the way, on our, our intake forums at Utah Valley University. And the most common examples are anxiety stress, bad is how they describe their relationship with money. So, and a lot of people feel that way. We know that money is the, one of the most stressful things that people deal with in, in America and really anywhere. So in one word, describe your relationship with money. And then this is my favorite follow-up question to that. In one word, describe what you would like your relationship with money to be. Again, in one word, describe what you would like your relationship with money to be. Let's go through a couple more. What was that like for you? When a client is describing a stressful financial situation that they went through or maybe a bad experience that they had with money, just this, this simple question, what was that like for you? What have you tried so far? As, as, you've, been, as you've been working on this, this problem, dealing with this issue of your child going off to college, what have you tried so far? What have you looked into? At the end of an appointment, I love to ask this. If you were to give yourself a homework assignment this week, what would it be? We know what they need to do and we know action steps that they need to take. But if they will identify those, they're much more likely to follow through on them. What is your first memory with money? That takes them really far back and makes them think a lot about money. What was money like in your family growing up? Have you ever made a financial decision that you later regretted? What did you learn from that experience? So lots of examples of powerful questions. Again, start thinking about the questions that you have, because I would love for you to share those with the group here in just a minute. But I want to share one more thing before we do that. So most of you know that I'm part of Financial Behavior Keynote Group. I mentioned that at the beginning that this webinar is sponsored by them. We are now offering CFP and AFC CEUs. So this one is this is a short session, so it doesn't qualify for CFP or AFC CEUs. But we have courses coming up that I want to tell you about. So upcoming courses, I'm teaching one all about communication. We'll be talking a little bit more about questions, a lot about listening. So the idea is seek first to understand. So that's going to be February 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's with myself. Uh, Mary, Dr. Mary Bell, Bell Carlson is doing applying behavioral finance into your practice. That will be in March. And you can find out about those at themastera.com slash FBKG. So I would encourage you to sign up for those. And because you attended this short session, we're actually giving you 50% off that the very first, my upcoming webinar next week. So, and you don't have to watch it live. If you can't be there live, you want to watch it later on, you, you can absolutely do that. So use the coupon code LISTEN 
uh, the, the capitalization is important. So it's capital L and then lowercase I-S-T-E-N. Utilize that and you'll get 50% off and it's valid until, until the day of the webinar on February 28th. So it's valid. It's, it's approved for one CFP CEU and also one AFC CEU. So with that, I would encourage you to, to connect with me. I, I have a, a website, ryanhlaw.com. I send out a weekly, very short email. If you want to be on my email list, it's like a 30 second to one minute email. And it's all about how to improve yourself or how to Im improve your communication with your clients. So I would encourage you to join me there and then also follow us on Financial Behavior Keynote Group.